So hi uh, and welcome to CAS 1395, which is all about converting to uh, S4HANA and really the lessons learned from a customer um, experience. And I'm Stephen Jerram from Intelligence in the UK. So I'm Brandon Austin. Uh, I'm not saying that slide go. Here we go. Uh, Brandon Austin, partner engineer for SUSE for uh, over four years. I've been in the industry for quite a bit longer than that. Uh, I support uh, all the North American partners, uh, although uh, Stephen is in the UK, he has a, a global uh, team that I help work with. Um, so just so you know and have a little bit of background, uh, SUSE has a long history with SAP. We co-developed together There's over 20 years of uh, collaboration. 90% of all HANA deployments are based on SUSE and 70% of all SAP apps run on SUSE. Uh, so since Intelligence works with SAP quite a lot, that means they work with SUSE quite a lot. Uh, so I'll be here to support Stephen uh, in his uh, description of what uh, this use case is. So okay, so as mentioned, I'm I'm Stephen uh, Jerram, and I'm I'm from Intelligence in the UK. I'm a I'm a solution director uh, for our UK business, um, and I've been working in the SAP sort of larger world and ecosystem for about 19 years now. Um, at the moment, my prime responsibility in the UK is looking after our uh, move program on how we move customers from their sort of current uh, SAP installations to uh, to S for HANA. Uh, Intelligence is a is a global business. We're a, an SAP Global Platinum partner. Um, in fact, the largest reseller um, of, of SAP software. We're a big we're a big organisation. We span the globe in 23 countries, and we look after customers' systems from an end-to-end -end perspective, all the way from the software sale through services covering implementation and support, and in, into how they run their um, SAP systems, be that through um, cloud or managed cloud or, or hybrid scenarios. So today's agenda uh, and the sort of story that we're going to talk about today um, is based around the customer's uh, experience of how they moved to s and I'm really going to break that down into three key um, areas. I'm going to talk a little bit about the customer, who they are, and the challenges that they faced at the beginning of this journey. I'll then talk at a high level about what the approach was. How did we do this? What were the sort of frameworks that we brought to bear on how we how we moved them to Esfahana? And then I'll actually dig a little bit deeper and really go into the story behind that story, and we'll pull out some of the tips and tricks and hints, really, that uh, that you could take away from this presentation. So the customer uh, and the challenge. So the customer in this case is a is a UK business called IESA. Um, they work in a, uh, in a sector called business process outsourcing. So really, the core of what they do is they look after other customers' um, procurement and inventory. So if you're an organization such as Jaguar Land Rover down the bottom there, big automotive um, business, IESA will be looking after the spares, um, the inventory of spare parts needed um, in their sort of maintenance stores, and also the procurement of that. And they do that procurement and stock management across a very large customer base. And what that allows them to do is generate enormous economies of scale in the procurement process, which they pass on to their, uh, to their customers. They've been running SAP for many years, since about 2003. In fact, they put SAP in because their customers that they were targeting were all running SAP. And they actually wanted to be seen at that point as a really credible business that were running credible um, solutions. So they've been running, like I say, they've been running SAP for um, for many years. In fact, it was 15 years at the point um, that we that we approached them to look at their move to S4. And they knew that they needed to move to the new platform, and they felt that there were some opportunities where they could improve. And those opportunities really fell really fell into three segments. There were there were some, if you like, IT operational efficiencies that they could gain. They had a, a very large application landscape. A lot of that was um, in-house written applications, and those are coming more and more costly just to keep the lights on, keep those things plumbed in together and singing and dancing together. They knew that they could gain some process efficiencies. A lot of the business processes that they've evolved, evolved on their sort of legacy ECC system were um, not really fit for the future, and they knew that there could be some improvements there. And every improvement they could make in terms of process efficiency directly impacted their bottom line and their, and their customers' bottom line as well. One of the big things that they needed to gain from this, from this platform shift was the ability to make faster and smarter decisions. They had a lot of information, but it became very time-consuming to turn that. So they had a lot of data, but it, turned, it was very time-consuming to turn that 
data into real um, insight that allowed them to make decisions that they, so they could run the business more effectively. Um, they also had customers uh, and prospective customers running in uh, multiple time zones. It was giving them a bit of a, uh, a bit of a challenge. And that, that time zone piece was really, I guess, at the core of the, um, the challenge that they faced. They had a big roadblock that was stopping them um, growing uh, internationally. They had a large customer base in the UK and in Europe. Um, they were looking to expand over into the, uh, into the US, but the way that their legacy estate had been um, built and the processes were running meant that there were some overnight routines and with that time zone difference, moving into the U.S. was just not, they didn't have the window um, in that sort of condensed timeline to, uh, to run those processes. So they knew they had to do something differently and had to move to the next platform to allow them to expand um, internationally. So they knew in their hearts that S4 was the right place that they needed to go. But they had a few questions when they first engaged with us. Um, they were a little bit confused because when we, when we talked to customers about the move to S4, there appears to be a bit too, you know, a lot of options, uh, and they sort of face that paradox of choice in terms of what was the right pathway, what was the right end destination in terms of how they would deploy that solution. They had some concerns um, about the risk of making that move, both to their internal systems and their, and their customers' processes, and the cost and the time that this would take. And they were also concerned about over engineering and over uh, if you like over scaling the uh, the project they wanted to, didn't want to make enormous moves and re-engineer in one go they wanted to do this at a bit more of a pace that suited um, suited them and bring these things in uh, in more of a sort of program approach so they had these these questions and these challenges in their mind and they also had a challenge around when to actually execute this so when to physically make this move from their current ECC estate into S4. And when they looked at their um, downtime windows, and when they looked at trying to map that onto the available windows from their customers, because their customers are using their SAP system directly, right, to manage their inventory and to, to manage their procurement, they ended up knowing that there were two windows in the year that they could execute this. That was either taking, uh, taking the, the, uh, the, the, the jump at, at Easter, um, or at Christmas, and both of those two events would give them the downtime that they needed and their customer downtime that they needed to make this. Now, in the timeline of this story, we're in October, okay? So the customer knew that they had to make some very, very quick um, assessments and decisions as to whether Easter was achievable. If not, the project would have to go live in Christmas. So time was in the essence from the get-go in, uh, in this customer story. So how did we solve this, right? So the customers laid out some challenges, um, so it's both from, a, from a, um, a project point of view and from a timeline uh, point of view. So what did Intelligence do to, to help the customer answer these um, questions? What was the high level approach that we used? Well, we deployed what we call our transformation um, framework, which is a really um, simple way that customers can not only move to S4, but ultimately then exploit the capability uh, within S4. It starts with the stage that we call assess. Now that's looking at the feasibility of the various move pathways and understanding which is the right one for, for, for any given customer, understanding the cost and time um, that that would take in order to make that move. Um, and then once they've made that move, what would be the, uh, the roadmap of transformation activity they would do to unlock the value of that move. So we carry out all of those assessments in our, in our assess phase. And that's phase one of this of this framework. Um, stage two is to actually execute the move. So whatever, whatever is the, the correct pathway for a given customer situation, we make that transition and we make that transition as fast and as low cost as we possibly can. And we go live with that solution at that point. And that really is then the entry ticket for um, stage three, the transformation stage, which is really where the value starts to be um, realized. And that transformation typically is a, is a series of, of, of projects wrapped within a, within a program of work to take advantage of um, the new capabilities that exist within S4. So if we think back to the customer situation here, once we've made that move to the new platform, being able to then exploit the uh, analytical capability and the real-time capability that exists within the platform, that then starts to get executed in, uh, in stage three. So that's our really simple 
you like at a high level um, framework that we that we employed and the customer um, bought into that approach really really quickly because it broke down what appeared to be a very large elephant into a series of bite-sized um, pieces that they could execute execute safely underpinning the heart of this if you like the, the move stage is the uh, is the intelligence package solution for executing that move so we have a, a conversion package what we call a ready to run conversion package um, that has a series of proven tools and methodologies it leverages what we call our conversion factory so some a team of highly skilled um, solution engineers that deal with the, the, the technical shift um, and leverages a hybrid um, delivery model. So that was at the core of our particular um, transformation framework. So Stephen, I see that you have, uh, you listed this here as a package ready to run solution. For me, that would imply uh, that you've done this many times. So how, how many customers would you say you guys have helped convert? Yeah, that's a good point, Brandon. Yeah, we so we've, so in the, as an intelligence as a global business, we've got over, um, I think it's nudging towards 400 customer projects that have uh, where we've deployed um, S4, um, and of that, um, knocking on now 100 projects have been conversion projects. So, um, and that's everything from sort of small to large scale um, installations, multiple instances across large landscapes. So we've got sort of a lot of experience in how we can help customers make that move, and an awful lot of experience of carrying out those those packaged S4 um, conversions. Given the complexity of any sort of SAP environment, uh, that sounds like a lot of experience. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we, we're pretty proud of our of our of our of ourselves and the and the experience that we've gained. And I think a lot of that comes from the you know is also highlighted through the customers that, that talk and and you know express the gratitude for in uh, to our intelligence for for executing that. So if we look at that framework, um, in terms of timeline, because uh, that's really one of the key questions that, that we get asked a lot in, in intelligence, as well as how much is this going to cost me, but how long is this actually going to take? And there's a perception sometimes that, that these can be um, sort of, you know, 12 month plus uh, projects. Now, leveraging that conversion package, conversion factory solution, that ready to run uh, solution, we can really condense the timeline. So. If we overlay the, the durations in uh, in this particular uh, story, the assessment phase was uh, was executed over four weeks. So that's where we could go in, and I'll talk a bit more detail um, shortly about what that uh, one ended up. But we could we could understand at a detail level the how and the and the why and the ongoing work that would be needed to make that move. We then executed that move in 22, um, 22 weeks. So. We were in October at the time frames that we were carrying out these um, the the assess uh, piece. So we got to November, and even though it was tight, it was still achievable for the customer to hit their Easter window. So that's the window that we then shot for both IESA and Intelligence with our conversion factory. We went, when if you like, all in to to achieve um, that Easter timeline, which was really beneficial for the customer because. Now, this ongoing expansion uh, internationally that they were being held up on, they didn't really want to have to wait until their next window in uh, in Christmas. Another new year has almost gone by, so knowing for certain that they could achieve that was was awesome for the uh, for the customer. And then the the transformation stage is where they are now. So they've got a whole series of of activities that they're doing. They're deploying the new user experience both internally and externally. They're in a they're in a process at the moment of re-engineering their um, their MRP process, which is at the heart of their procurement and, and billing engine, that's being re-engineered to allow that real time and that uh, international expansion. And they're providing not only uh, an, an improved user experience for their customers, they're providing more real time uh, analytics. They had these big issues with batch processing and overnight processing of information, and their customers, both internally and externally, were demanding that to be more in the moment. So they're now able to offer that real-time um, analytics. So that's an ongoing um, package of work that the customer is continually transforming. And, and in their world, they can never stand still. They're always looking to optimize, engineer, and, and change and offer new capabilities to their to their customers. So in simple terms, that's the story that, that IESA embarked on, right? So they had a they knew they needed to move over to S4. Um, 
they had some challenges about the uh, the size and duration of that project, and they had a particular challenge about when they could execute that 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 conversion, that move over in terms of the two, those two windows. So, for, and from the outside there, it was a great story. We achieved that success within within 22 weeks. But what's the real story, if you like, behind that story? So, coming back to our framework. Um, and I spoke earlier about the, the assessment um, phase there. So the first four weeks of this, of this engagement, what really took place there? So within that assessment, a series of activities and a series of services were deployed and a series of tools from SAP to, to really understand the, the customer's situation. So we ran the readiness check, and that is, that is the sort of the absolute mandatory go-to tool to understand at a technical level how and if you can move that system over to, to S4, and then, rely, and then really engaging a, an experienced partner to understand the results of that, of that readiness check. We then carried out a technical assessment of their landscape in terms of um, systems outside of their core ECC from an interoperability point of view to make sure that that integration would still um, function. We really importantly looked at the um, what I say people the simplification items. So all the things that are going to be changing when they make their move from ECC to S4, so that the customer was aware of what would be different and what the mitigation and remediation would be. And really, what that also starts to do is answer the how risky, how costly, um, and what then the duration of the of that move and what would that look like. And it brings some science um, to bear. We looked at all the add-ons um, that the customer had, both SAP and third party, uh, to make sure that those were compatible with the, uh, the solution. We examined their custom code, and we talked quite a lot with them and made sure that they understood the infrastructural requirements during the project and post-go-live, and also the readiness of that customer to execute the, um, the, the testing. Yeah, and when I think of infrastructure and, and test readiness, uh, obviously, you know, hardware is a big piece of that, how you architect it, uh, but there's also the software side that uh, SUSE can help with. So uh, making sure that you have HA set up, which is included automatically uh, in uh, SLES for SAP, uh, being able to, to test that very easily, having good documentation on that, uh, even stuff like uh, the ability to have live patching, which is an add-on that you could always do there, so you don't have to have that downtime, making sure you test that out correctly. Uh, so there's a lot of things that uh, we help uh, with in those particular pieces, particularly being able to make sure that you have that redundancy and can test it effectively. Yeah, absolutely. That, that readiness of the, of, the, of the project infrastructure and the target operational infrastructure is really, really vital. So we carried out that assessment, and I guess this is this is takeaway number one. So um, whilst there are lots of common aspects of an S4 move, it's really, really vital to understand your situation. So make sure you understand what that readiness check means for you, make sure you understand what the infrastructure uh, means for you, and make sure that you understand how you're going to carry out that move to S4, okay? So understanding yours is really, really key. Now, at the end of that four-week exercise, um, we turn those three challenges into understood and achievable goals. So the customer had a validated path that they were going to use to get to S4. They had not only an understandable cost and timeline, but an acceptable uh, cost and timeline, leveraging that um, conversion factory solution. And we knew how to control the scope. We knew what was going to get remediated. We knew what was going to be changed on day one and what was going to be evolve through that living roadmap in that transformation phase. So it gave the customer real clarity and certainty about what this project really, really looked like. So that was great. So that was the assessment. So we did that. So that was four weeks, and the customer knew where they were. Then we moved into, if you like, the meat of the, uh, of, of the sandwich, the, the move exercise. So this was that 22 weeks um, project duration to get from get-go of turning, of pressing go on the, uh, on, on the project to actually going, low, going live over that Easter weekend. So which pathway did the customer take? So, um, and there are really three core pathways that are, that are typically recognized when we look at a move to S4, either a system conversion or brownfield, um, a new implementation or, or greenfield, or what's known as the selective data transition, typically for complex multi-instance landscapes. Um, that assessment enabled Itelligence and the customer to understand that, and for Itelligence to recommend a system conversion. It was the best way um, and the, uh, the right way for that customer to make that move over. 
And again, that was using our um, our conversion um, factory, that package ready to run uh, process. Conversions can be are, are technically uh, quite challenging. Um, making use of, a, of an organization such as ourselves has got that experience in it is a really, really um, key aspect. And in that in that package solution um, for the S4 conversion, um, I guess it's, it's useful just to bring out um, how some of the dynamics that take place here. So I, I used the word conversion factory um, earlier. So that's a that's an organization within intelligence whose sole job um, is to execute system conversions for SEP um, customers. So they have huge strength in depth and, and skill in executing that. Um, those guys tend to um, be formed into little clusters that are running multiple projects um, at once. Because a, a system conversion project, if you looked at the that sort of effort um, curve over time, is a little bit lumpy from a technical standpoint. And so by overlaying multiple projects at once, we can have those guys working really efficiently um, and that obviously has a, a cost impact um, to our to our customers. So we've got those guys at the at the core of this uh, of this project. And then there are two further organisations. There's the customer on the right hand side here, as um, as by ESA, um, and they bring in their project management, their system skills, their their knowledge of their existing processes, and that's backed up with our intelligence on site team. So regardless of where this is taking place. There's a team from intelligence working hand in glove with the customer, um, you know, taking them through the changes and the revised processes and helping them understand how to make best use of that of that capability going forward. So I want to make sure I understand this better. Um, this seems like kind of the key value to me with this conversion factory. So uh, I'm assuming that this is all they do are these conversions or do they have other uh, responsibilities. No, they're, they're, this is, they're those guys in that conversion factory, their day-to-day -day job is working with all of our customers and, and executing system conversions. So they're like highly specialist guys working in those teams that are dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's no substitute for experience, right, when we're doing, dealing with a project like this. They really, really bring that to the fore. Yeah, even further, even more than experience, just, um, you know, if somebody's doing a conversion at a, their, their company, they, at most they're doing that once, whatever, four or five years, and it's going to be different every time, whereas these guys are probably seeing the same issues, the same uh, uh, problems crop up and already know how to fix them, so that seems like pretty, yeah, absolutely. pretty yeah, important that, that to this whole puzzle. Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, in fact, from a customer standpoint, the, the move from ECC to S4 is like a, a one-time deal, so... Um, there's not a lot of value in a customer skilling up to execute that process to never to never execute that again. So whereas our guys hundreds of times are executing it, so it's it's you know it's really you know that, that's where that benefit comes. Okay, so that's the that's the if you like the model and um, and and the uh, and the use of that conversion factory. But how does the? I just want to give you a glimpse, if you like, of how that conversion actually takes place. And when we talk about a conversion. Um, in my world, we're talking about a number of cycles of conversion. And when we started the exercise with um, with AISA, we were going to go. We were going to run three conversion cycles. So two test cycles, two test conversions, and the productive um, version. So I'll quickly walk you through the steps that actually get placed in a, in a simplified uh, manner. So firstly, we need a direct copy of their of their production system or your production system, and we and we spin that into a into a sandbox. And at that stage, we then execute step two, which is to carry out the system conversions as the software updates, the process changes, the code remediation, all of that gets carried out. Uh, and that system, if you like, converted into um, an S for HANA um, system running on, running on HANA, running on SUSE. Now, I said here that we started out knowing that we would take three conversion um, cycles. Now, what happened here uh, with IESA was it really highlighted the criticality of having the right infrastructure in place. When we did this first conversion cycle, the, the production copy wasn't really representative of production from a, from a horsepower point of view. There wasn't the right infrastructure in the, in the organization to execute this effectively. So it's really, really important to know that you've got the right infrastructure at the right time uh, in that project. Once we'd executed that system conversion, uh, we moved into then stage three, which is functional testing. So AISA, um, end-to-end, across all of their processes, 
um, were testing that um, solution or started to test that solution. And that's really where tip number three um, kicks in. Um, it's all well and good saying that you um, believe you're ready to carry out that testing, but you really need to be ready to carry out that testing. When that system is converted, you are going to need to test that end to end. You're going to look at you're going to need to look at testing both from a inside SAP perspective and outside in that wider application landscape. So in order to condense those timelines, it's really key to make sure that at the point that you you need to test, you have the right test procedures, the test known if you like test scope, test library, um, test scripts, and the environment within which to test as well. When we're looking at sort of a uh, an external to SAP application standpoint. Now, because there were some challenges there, and that was, which is why I've really drawn out those two tips, in, uh, in the context of IESA, that meant that we had to inject in, because that, that first conversion didn't quite run as smoothly as it needed to. So we injected in uh, and took the decision from, from, the, from the point where we recognized it that we needed to inject in a, an additional conversion cycle. And in the project, this conversion cycle became known as conversion 1.5. Um, so what we did there was in stage four, we, we repeated ourselves. So we took a fresh copy of production. We executed that conversion again, bringing some of the, the knowledge and experience from that prior um, conversion in, in, step, uh, in step two. And again, carried out that, that large scale um, system testing where the customer is testing this uh, end to end. And at the end of that testing process, we then created their new development environment. So one of the one of the um, things to us sort of understand in the uh, in some of the processes here is that we don't tend to take those existing Dev and QA systems. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of sort of um, non-functional processes and there's a lot of challenge in converting those systems. So we we're advocates of sort of clearing the decks uh, and starting afresh with a with a brand new development environment. So. And that got invoked at that point. And from then onwards, we were into a sort of a, a development freeze or a development change minimization uh, process. And that was, that was spawned from conversion cycle 1.5. And then, and then we go again. So we're now in our third cycle of, uh, of, of conversion testing. So we go back to the start line again. We take a fresh copy of production. Um, we execute that conversion um, process. So all the way through those conversion cycles, we are we're, we're shoring up the exact sequence of steps because every customer situation is slightly um, unique. All the things that need to take place as we execute the software update, the remediation, the code change, the data migration, and so on and so forth. So we executed that again for the for the third time, and then the business executed what really becomes user acceptance testing. So we're at the final conversion cycle before the sort of go no go decision for um, for the production cutover so the business is doing end-to-end -end user acceptance testing to make sure that that system is behaving from an outcome perspective in the same way that it did before and still meets the needs of the uh, of the business so we've now executed three cycles slightly confusingly called one one and a half in two in this in this uh, particular project um, context and then we move into the real uh, production cutover. So we're now at Easter, okay, on the uh, on on the timeline. So the first thing we'll do is we'll convert the actual production systems. So that gets moved over, all the software updates, all the remediation, and so forth, executed on uh, production. We then do some pre-release testing, as as you would in in terms of a real production system. And at that stage, we were good to go live, and a new um, QA or test environment was then um, spawned from that production system. So the customer's now got a brand new three-tier S for HANA landscape with all of their processes, all of their data, and all of their customization um, in place. Now, one of the one of the things I guess to really take uh, take away from this exercise is this: none of these steps are dress rehearsal. So it's really key from the get-go in conversion cycle one to treat this as though it was a production cutover. The same rigor in terms of documenting steps and sequences, ownerships of tasks, understanding durations of tasks is really, really key. So all the way through our conversion cycles, through 1, 1.5, and 2, we're really making sure we're treating this as though it was a production cutover. In fact, in conversion cycle 2, it was run in cutover conditions. So 
uh, 24 hour working over a weekend so that we knew that the lines of communication and so forth would really work um, effectively. So at the end of this process, um, we had uh, we've gone through a number of uh, a number of cycles and a number of things that sort of um, been brought to bear there. I've picked out a couple in terms of the infrastructural readiness, the ready you know being in a position to test and treating this as a as as a as a go live situation from from day one. Now along the way there, one of the things that is is vital to understand in a in an S four conversion project. One of the questions that I used to had at the very very beginning was well, how long is this actually going to take when it comes to downtime. So when we started um, looking at this and we look at our particular cycles, we started at the very, very beginning, the first conversion cycle we ran, there was a predicted downtime of 230 hours. Now, that wasn't acceptable from a, from a customer window uh, perspective in terms of meeting that Easter weekend. So along the way, um, primarily through the injection of that additional cycle in 1.5, because we realized that there were some infrastructural and uh, sort of readiness um, issues, uh, through some tuning, through some hard work with the project teams, both IESA, intelligence, and the conversion factory, we managed to tune that all the way down to 64 hours worth of, um, of downtime that was needed um, on the production cutover weekend. Now, you might be looking at that and still thinking, wow, 64 hours still feels, uh, feels a lot. And I'm here saying what a great exercise that was to get down from 230 hours. Now, there's a, there's a fifth tip here that's, that's really worth highlighting. Um, in this particular customer's context, um, when we executed the move to S4, they weren't quite at, if you like, the start line for a conversion. So their system wasn't at the, the right release. Um, for some operational reasons, they wanted to address those in the project. Now, what that meant ultimately was that their downtime window was larger than it needed to be. Um, so one of the key messages here in terms of executing a project and having predictable and right-sized downtime windows is get your systems match fit. Be at the right level in terms of database, OS, um, system patch level, and so forth. Because if you do, then you can take advantage of really some of the downtime uh, minimized uh, approaches from, from SAP. But we got it down to a window that still met the customer's, um, customer's needs. And they went live on that Easter weekend. Um, in fact, it was the Tuesday morning. So we started this on, uh, in the UK on Good Friday. Um, through that Easter weekend, we executed it. They went through a rigorous pre-release testing process and released the system to the users on uh, on the Tuesday morning, seven o'clock, I think it was in the morning uh, on Tuesday. And I think one of the great quotes that we that was right for this organisation because they needed to, this to be non-disruptive was that their customers and a lot of their users didn't really know that anything had changed. All this work had taken place behind the scenes and set them into a position where they could start to really re-engineer their processes. Now, I've spoken a lot as we've gone through here about the the timeline of this um, of this uh, of this project. Now, I just want to really sort of touch on how this how this looked from a uh, from a duration um, standpoint. So, so we started as we always do with a plan, right? So we had a plan um, with a series of phases that we would, that we would walk through and the three planned conversion um, cycles. So that's what we that's what we started with in November. Um, now, let's overlay the, the realities and the actuals on here. So um, well, in terms of preparation, we were spot on. So that took as long as it took. So in terms of getting um, environments and system copies and, and so forth and mobilizing teams. And the first conversion cycle to convert and test did take the planned amount of time. But in there, as I mentioned earlier, it became apparent that the, uh, the infrastructure and their readiness to test wasn't right. So we knew straight away that we needed to inject um, an additional phase. So at the, at the tail of that first conversion, we were now parallel running this additional 1.5 um, conversion uh, cycle. So we were injecting an additional timeline there. And that meant that all of our conting uh, contingency in our plan was we knew from that point was going to get consumed if we wanted to hit the immovable date that is Easter, right? We can't uh, we can't change that calendar. So we executed 1.5 over a six-week duration. Because we were now into our third cycle of um, testing, we were able to collapse a little bit the duration for the 
um, for the third CV2 convert and test cycle. But then ultimately, we executed the sort of um, the preparation activities and the actual cutover on the right weekend because there was no there was no opportunity for us to shift Easter and shift another weekend. It was all about working really effectively in those cycles, parallel running where we needed to, and and really getting our the the process and the communication um, down to a T so that we could remove all the slack in that uh, in that plan. But we did it successfully. That that customer went live. And I really like the. Sorry, the real that you have that uh, contingency kind of built in at this year has taught us anything uh, is that you kind of have to be prepared for the unexpected. Absolutely. I guess, you know, when, certainly when you're looking at, a, at an S4 conversion, it's really only when you execute the first conversion that all, if you like, all of your dirty laundry comes out and, and gets, you know, get put on display at that point. So, so you need to build in a bit of contingency because some unknowns will absolutely um, appear during that, during that project. So that was the 22 weeks up to uh, up to Easter, and the customers now in this um, transformation phase. So that's that's ongoing. Right? So they've been doing that since that uh, since that point, continually deploying that new user experience, re-engineering their processes, and taking advantage of the of the of the real time analytical um, capabilities of S4, both internally um, and externally. So. So in summary, what would my key takeaways be, I guess, as, we, as, as I've gone through this uh, case study? What are the key tips? So, so tip number one was understand your situation. There's no substitute for real um, information and an assessment and understanding of your landscape and what your move to us forward look like. So things like readiness checks, code assessments, um, infrastructural assessments, so forth. So it's really key that you know what your situation is going to look like. Make sure that you've got the right infrastructure and you're working with the right partners and you're running these things on the right um, infrastructure. And you understand what your all the requirements will be, both from a from an interim project perspective and from a from an operational HR HA DA, uh, DR uh, point of view as well. So make sure that you know from the get go and that you have access to the right infrastructure at the right time. That's tip number two. Tip number three: absolutely be ready to test. Um, most customers that I ever speak to uh, are probably not as ready as they really, really think they are in terms of a full understanding of their the solution scope, um, a full understanding of where those scripts, be they uh, manual or electronic, where they live, and having full access to some test environments that allow end-to-end -end testing to take place. So make sure that you're ready at the right point in that project really, really early to have the right um, uh, ability to execute those tests. Understand that it's not a dress rehearsal, right? So it's, I think it's really key to have a, a mindset and a philosophy um, where you treat this as a go live cutover exercise from day one. It's about having that rigor. It's about having that diligence in terms of documenting the, the steps and the sequence, gaining repeatability, because variables are not our friends in one of these uh, in one of these conversion projects. So knowing exactly who's doing what, when it's going to take place, and how long it's going to take absolutely um, vital and get match fit so with a project such as this there will always be things that you can do in advance to make the move um, both quicker easier and less less disruptive and as intelligence and me personally I, mean, I always preach that if you can execute something beforehand just to shrink what we call box two that move box if you can shrink that down that's absolutely going to pay dividends and it will make that move um, so much easier and allow you to really then focus on the transformational uh, activities that you'll execute in box uh, in box three. Now those five tips and a, and a number of others we've as intelligence we've condensed down to something that we call our 10, uh, 10 mantras our 10 s4 mantras there's a there's a, uh, a URL on the page there uh, feel free there's a white paper um, to go and access um, and um, read at your uh, read at your leisure. And so we've taken all of our learnings globally, really, in, into those into those ten mantras, and continually update those with the tips and tricks that we that we find out along the way. So with that, that really brings me to the end of the um, uh, in the end of that story uh, about a particular customer's move over to S4. If you do have questions, feel free to um, email myself, Stephen, or or to Brandon as well, and um, we will do our best to. Um, to get back to you with the answer to those. So thanks ever so much for listening. 
um, and listening to the lessons learned from a from a customer's experience. Um, have a great SUSECON um, virtual conference. Enjoy the rest of your day, um, and thanks for listening. Well, thanks a lot, Stephen, for, for giving that presentation. Uh, I also want to mention to those watching that if you're doing this on the SUSECON website, you can also interact with us on the chat uh, in the actual session, uh, but the email addresses are there if you need them.